Hey, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. We're about a month away from finding out if anybody is going to join the hallowed halls out there in Cooperstown, New York. And so I decided to invite three of my friends who know about the selection process. Uh, We're going to be joined, first of all, by a guy I used to go to school with my freshman year at the University of Michigan, Domino from the New York Post, Ken Davidoff. Hello, Ken. How are you? Chris, is always a pleasure. That, that joke is the most inside joke ever in the history of inside jokes. I know. Maybe we'll clarify it over the next 45 minutes if to an you, hour. If you I like. Don't, I, don't, I <laughs> yeah. think it's probably It's really not that funny. That's the thing. It really yeah. isn't. It's a great yeah. call. Great call. Uh, you know him from uh, Metal Arc Media, ESPN as well. Howard Bryan, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you? Did I pull you away from your gaming afternoon? I like the uh, I like the headset you got working. Were you playing Call of Duty or uh, something else? I'm just a first person shooter guy, man. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. We know this yeah. guy is a uh, first person shooter. There's no, no question these about are, it. You see him on old, ESPN. Old headphones. Do we go, uh, Jeff? Passan, is that what our guys Jimmy and Jake call you? Is that what I, I, I'm pretty sure? It's just passing. 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 Yeah, we're not going to use that over the next forty-five to an hour. <laughs> thank that, that God. Would get I, thank you. Please, just holy a, Every like, we don't even need to call this a John Boy Media production. Let's just call this like, mm-hmm. like rosy time. I'll get you guys a free shirt. Thank you. Nice. Would, would this make your holiday season complete? Rep that. Those rotation. I would rep that. Okay. I Good. probably wouldn't. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Ken wouldn't have a choice. He'd have to. Oh, man, with pride, with pride. Uh (laughs) Guys, I appreciate you being with us. Um, First thing I want to get out of the way, Ken, you are still an active voter. Jeff and Howard are still eligible to vote. Um, However, Howard, you you choose not to. Let's get this out on the table. Why? Um, Well, it's pretty simple. I mean, I think that I think for me, we always knew, like, I think I got my first vote. Kenny, I don't know when you got your first in, but for me, it was 2007, 2008. I think it was Rice um, was the, no, Rice got in 2009, but I think my first vote was 2007. And, um, and, you know, we knew that steroids was hanging over all of our heads and there was going to come a point in time when the entire ballot was going to be steroid era ballot. And I think that I've always been conflicted about what to do with that. Um, because who knows, we all had our suspicions. We all thought we knew there were some people that we absolutely knew. But the biggest thing that really turned me off to the whole voting process was I don't like what baseball did to us as voters. I don't like the fact that baseball did not give us any guidelines. They gave us guidelines on Pete Rose. They gave us guidelines on the Black Sox and all of those different things, but they never gave us a single guideline on, guidelines on steroids. And they essentially punted the responsibility to the writers while voting themselves in. Joe Torrey's in the Hall of Fame. Bobby Cox is in the Hall of Fame. Tony La Russa is in the Hall of Fame. Bud Selig's in the Hall mm-hmm. of Fame. And so all of these guys and, and the, the executives are all going in. Billy Bean and Theo Epstein, they'll all be in the Hall of Fame. And they all benefited from the steroid era and they all had a responsibility to it. But they're leaving the punishment of the players to us. And I think that's completely unfair. I think that's a, I think that's a labor issue and I don't want to be a a labor stooge for management where we get to punish the players and they vote themselves into the hall of fame. Fair enough, Jeff. um, You have not cast a vote since 2017. I believe you wrote a column back when you were working for Yahoo uh, upset at a letter you received from the hall of famer, Joe Morgan at the time. And you said, I'm not going to fill out my ballot and you have not since correct. Yeah. uh, Howard, uh, I'm, I'm more of a grandstander clearly. And Howard is, is just righteously indignant. Um, You know, the the point that he made about having no instruction uh, from baseball, there was none from the hall of fame either until that letter came out. And, and the letter was signed by Joe Morgan. Um, I think it was more of an imprimatur uh, to to get his name, you know, someone who has as much gravitas as he does on there to try and push the agenda that the hall for a long time had really, I think, been afraid to say to writers because there had always been little nudges. You always saw every year Hall of Fame players come out and say, well, we don't want our little group uh, of of. Uh, of of people who make this place so hallowed to be infected by those dirty, dirty PED users. And 
I, I look at that and, and part of me understands the rationale behind it. And part of me also says, let's stop taking the Hall of Fame so seriously. This is a museum. That's what it is. It's not some, some place up on a hill where you don't have people who have sinned, who have done wrong. You've got scumbags in the Hall of Fame already. You've got steroid users in the Hall of Fame already. And the idea that just because guys had been testing positive makes them any worse than those before who use them and, and makes it such that the Hall finally now decides to put something out, it, it just didn't sit right with me. Because when I look at the Hall of Fame, to me, it's a place that should celebrate the best players in history. And the notion that Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and Alex Rodriguez are not among the best players in history, I just have difficulty squaring that. So if the Hall is going to come to me and say through Joe Morgan that you'd better take a really good look at this and make sure that you want to vote for these guys, well, uh, that's just not something that I feel comfortable participating in, though. I completely understand why Ken and why hundreds of other people still do. Ken, why do you? Uh, primarily, Chris, because I'm a mercenary and it's good for my business. You know, when I when I publish <laughs> my Hall of Fame ballot uh, on the New York Post website, it does very well. Uh, I you know I typically go on the MLB Network with Brian Kenny, and he and I have it out, yeah, you know, because he and I are on uh, on the alternate ends of the steroids debate. Uh, that's why I do it, Chris. I don't disagree with a word that Howard or Jeff just said. I and I spent that Joe Morgan. You know, holy crap, was that awful? Uh, but uh, I do it because it's good for me. Fair enough. Uh, it is a very interesting ballot for several reasons this year, and I know <laughs> that even though Howard and Jeff will not partake in the voting, and Ken, you will. I know that the two of you certainly will have some opinions, and we'll start with Alex Rodriguez, who is first time eligible. Uh, Howard. Would you vote for him if you were voting? Um, no, probably not. But once again, I think this is the this is the conflict. What a stupid thing to say. How could you not vote for somebody with 3000 hits and 696 home runs? I mean, this is the this is the bill coming due on all of this. And and, and that's the reason why it's such a difficult, such a difficult ballot. And and me not really having the right answers is why I'm not voting, not because I'm some sort of steroid moralist, although I didn't appreciate all these guys for 20 years lying to our faces and hurting our careers, which is what they did as well. Let's not forget that there was a human cost to this as well. If you're Steve Wilstein and if you're some of those other guys, it wasn't as though this was just some harmless thing. You know, Tony La Russa and those guys went out trying to hurt your they tried to end your careers. You know, and so as a as a writer, as a professional, you take that really, really seriously. Um, but Alex Rodriguez, you know, he's an interesting character because he's the guy who is twice admitted and yet never failed a drug test. <laughs> so it also depends on how you how you view him. Do you do you view him in the Andy Pettit category where you sort of cop to what you did and then you move on? Or because he's that special Alex Rodriguez character that you place a certain different uh, dispensation on him. But once again, I remember 1998, my first year on the beat, and A-Rod was probably, I think, 98 was in his second year, second full season or third full season? Third. Third, third, third full yeah. season, right? Yeah. And Billy Bean comes over to me and says, that's the greatest shortstop of all time right now. I said, he's 22. He's like, doesn't matter. He's the best ever right now. And so Alex has been carrying that for a 25 years. And it's a really hard thing to say that, no, I wouldn't vote for him. He's, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer that he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, okay, so I, I, I think we're probably going to get into this with Bonds, too, because I, I think there's a group of people who have the he was a Hall of Famer before he started using an excuse to bifurcate. I, I, I despise that argument, too. I, I just I, I, I don't think it carries any water like I, I'm, I'm sorry, but he used that that's part of his legacy and you take the person as a whole you can't it, it, like he's not on the ballot as barry bonds skinny and then barry bonds <laughs> bochy head like there's there's a big difference between those two can you things. just put a comma on there barry bonds 86 to 99 
Because <laughs> right, exactly. that's Barry pretty Bonds good right who, there. Barry Bonds who stole bases. Yeah. Um, Barry Bonds who won gold gloves but didn't deserve them. I mean, I mean there, there's <laughs> no. the, five Oosh. hopped it to Spanky. Uh, I was the, thank you. Exactly. I'm sorry. The Sid Bream throw. Sid Breen beat you to the plate, dude. That should be like, enough to keep you out of Cooperstown. That's exactly right. If there's any reason Barry Bonds should and be That's in, the reason I'm not that voting. fucking throw. Uh, uh, Ken? Yeah, I haven't filled out my ballot yet, but I, <clears throat> I'd be very surprised if I did not include Alex. And well, the, I used to have a delineation between those guys like Bonds and Clemens who – were never caught, quote unquote, and never paid a penalty. And guys like Palmero, Manny, and A Rod, who under a collectively bargained agreement were caught and served time. I said, all right, I'm comfortable drawing that line. You know, no on Palmero, no on Manny. Then Bud Selig retired as commissioner. And as Howard referenced earlier, they yep. could not wait to get Bud Selig on the Hall of Fame. Yep. I mean, it was like they had the greatest offensive line in history. <laughs> just, you know, just a. So it's a plow a path they for just Bud pushed Steel. it forward. Yeah. And you know what? If, and I, look, I, I love Bud. I, you know, he's, he's the most personal guy in the world. And it's not the steroid stuff that got me about Bud. It's collusion. Yes. Because I now, Jeff, are you old enough to remember collusion? Like like Tim no. Raines? Not, I mean, Jeff, you're like 10 I'm, years. I, I, I read Lords of the Realm all the okay. time. So, yes. But just as a, yeah. Familiar. Yes. I, generally speaking, I do know what collusion is, Ken. Thank you. I know. I know. But, but specifically the. the yes. 80, the 1986. The, yes. The idea that like the 1987 season started and like I was 16. So I was smart enough to understand me. But it's like, you know, for a little kid, like why isn't Tim Raines in baseball right now? Oh, right. the owners colluded to keep him out of baseball. <laughs> like, you know. The, like, I find that far more offensive than guys taking drugs to play better. Uh, and guess what? That was collectively bargained. That's right. And guess what? Bud Seal got caught not once, not twice, but thrice. Mm -hmm. As as per his own uh, image people, one of the most powerful owners in baseball, he was caught three times colluding, and they could not wait to get him in the Hall of Fame. So that's when I said, well, screw this. All board for Manny. Raffi had already left the ballot. You know, I'm all bored for a Rod. I'm all now. I'm all bored for Pete Rose. Let him in too. Uh, well, how can you? How can you not? Yeah. When the game is run by DraftKings, I mean, it's like this is the. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not even really joking about this. I'm like, okay, times change, right? And the entire idea of Rose and Joe Jackson and the rest of it was integrity. Well, the yeah, game's okay. gone full in on gambling right now. It's gone all the way in on gambling. Now, Rose is far more problematic, and you could make an argument that it's it, in a lot of ways it's no different than, you know, than the than mass incarceration, right? Okay, that there was a time when we had drug laws against marijuana, and now marijuana is legal, but we don't take those guys out of jail; they stay in jail. Okay, I can see that argument. I don't like that argument, but I get the argument. But on the collusion part of it, one hundred percent. 100%. I'm working on a, a bio on Ricky Henderson right now. And all the talk, all the New Yorkers all know it when they keep talking about all oh, those Yankee teams of the 80s, man, we just couldn't pitch. You were colluding as well. Yep. You weren't even trying to get better. You had Mattingly at his peak, Winfield, Ricky, Don Baylor, and chose not to sign pitchers. Right? So somebody's got to an answer for that. And so I, all of this does get really, really messy. And I, you know, and there was a part of me where I was sort of in Ken's camp um, where I just started thinking, screw it, right? I mean, time, enough time has passed. Has everybody paid a certain level of price? Um, and maybe, maybe the chapter closes by simply saying, hey, this is it. These guys were good enough. They belong in and, and do it. And then I started thinking, OK, well, if that happens, it's just not going to happen with my name on it. But if it happens, I'm not going to be upset about it. How can you be upset about Barry Bond being in the Hall of Fame? Am I a bad human being for looking yes. at the A-Rod situation, <laughs> situation this way? <laughs> I think the only reason he has joined Fox and ESPN is to try and win over the baseball writers. And kind of half-ass fall on a sword you know you know i did wrong i hope that one day people will look <laughs> at me and perhaps say that is good that i um 
you know, that, that I was good enough to get into Cooperstown. I just hope, you know, I mean, did you just do the wash? Wow. I mean, dead boy. So I, I am like, I'm sorry. I, maybe I'm, this is, makes me a bad person that I think that this whole thing has been a charade so that when he finally appeared on the ballot, that he has won over enough people in the BBWAA. Is that what they all do, though? He's also done that stuff to get laid, though. (laughs) (laughs) A Hall of Fame move if I've ever seen one. It worked. That's good. That's good. Um, All right, so, I mean, does anybody buy it? Do you think anybody... Jeff, do you think anybody changes their vote based on the way that A-Rod has uh, designed this whole public play the last five years? No, because I think sports writers, generally speaking, are a bunch of cynical, salty bastards who who pride themselves on seeing through plays like that. I, I think I think the reinvention of Alex Rodriguez um, has been as much about what the next 20 years for him look like Mm. as the past 20 years looked like and i think i think he surrounds himself with enough people that at least one of them is bound to be honest with him and say that if barry bonds is not getting in you're probably not getting in either like barry bonds never tested positive so you've got that group of people who are not going to hold him accountable for that Barry Bonds was a better player than you, so you've got that working against Mm you. I I just think the three-quarters threshold is an incredibly difficult bar to to go over because as much as the electorate in the BBWA has moved in the direction of putting steroid users into the Hall of Fame, and I think that's due in part because – more guys who have been linked to steroids have gotten in there, but also because the stigma uh, over the last 20 years, I think, has faded some, especially among the younger writers who are now at the 10-year threshold and are getting votes. Um, Bonds is still really the litmus test, I think. And unless someone like David Ortiz, who, because he was part of the survey testing, gets a pass, uh, I, I just don't see the path for A-Rod, even though he was as great as he was. And as as Howard said, he was undeniably great. And I, I mean, there, I, I, I will always remember an anecdote, Allard Baird, uh, you know, longtime general manager of the Royals, uh, super scout guy who has uh, a brain and a mind for baseball that's uh, difficult to match in the industry. He went and saw Alex Rodriguez as an amateur uh, down in Miami, and he was afraid to file his report because he wanted to put an 80 on an amateur player. And for those who don't know what the scouting scale is, an 80 is as high as you can get. It means the guy is like a 70 is like a Hall of Famer, and 80 is the greatest player ever. And it's just like what Billy Bean said to Howard. Like, it, even at that age, people knew what Alex Rodriguez was. Yeah, and right. if you follow Selena Roberts, he was using back then, too. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, just just as a as a detail, right? So, I mean, and I, and I think that, too, the other thing that's taken place here is that we, I was always under the assumption that those guys were going to get in and that they would be in by now. And my rationale for that was that I felt like there was a, a, a bigger wave of younger voters who were going to simply tilt the scales. And I guess there's a lot of us who are still alive, right? I mean, I don't know what the, <laughs> I don't know what the actual makeup of the BBWA is, but I feel like um, there's a lot of old voters still voting. And so I don't know what that what that percentage of, of the ballot is. Well, okay. So can we, that- can we can we can we can we for a second just talk about this a little bit because I, I I don't I don't feel like I'm airing dirty laundry here as much as I am being transparent. Um, there are a lot of people I think who vote for the Hall of Fame who should not vote for the Hall of Fame. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't think that because you spent 10 years in the BBWA in any particular role that you necessarily deserve a Hall of Fame vote uh, ad infinitum. And I know I know we've cleared the the 
role some, but uh, there are some people who were in the BBWA for 10 years who didn't do shit when it came to covering baseball. And, and this is not to impugn the editors out there. Who, yes, it is. Who, not, not entirely, because some of them actually do play an important role in baseball coverage. But there are a lot of people who are just along for the ride and who were in the BBWA so they can get credentials in the postseason. That's the reality. Real quickly, Jeff, people don't are listening to this and they may not understand. Essentially, you're like a tenured professor, right? Once you get in, yeah. it it's there forever. You don't have to continue to prove that you're either working a beat or covering wow. it on a national scale. Kenny, is that accurate? Then what they've done in recent years is once you're out, you know, you used, you know, if you retired at age 50, you could vote for 40 years if you live that long. Now, once you're out for 10 years, which I think is very forgiving, uh, then then they do cut you off. Got it. OK. Yeah. And I, and I tend to think as well um, not to criticize Jeff, even though it's really easy. Um, you know, I don't like the reflective or the 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 sort of the, the way that we look at Hall of Fame voters when it comes to baseball. I think it's bullshit. I think that we spend more time ba- baseball voting for the Hall of Fame is the most scrutinized voting in America, including voting for president. Right. I mean, we sit and talk about immediately taking people's votes away. That's like the that's like the starting point. Who doesn't deserve this? Right. You start out, Jeff, talking about how the Hall of Fame is just a museum and it's not this hallowed place. Now you move to you shouldn't have a vote and you shouldn't have a vote and you shouldn't vote and you shouldn't vote and you shouldn't vote. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, exactly. I, I don't I don't think I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. Though. They're not I necessarily think... mutually exclusive, but they are. But they do run in some opposition to each other. If you're trying to call the voters because you're trying to find the most curated, most knowledgeable, most educated, if it's just a museum, then let people have their opinions. Right. I mean, if you're really trying to find out who the best players were and who the people are who are most qualified to determine that. Then the, 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 the people who I want putting art in into the MoMA or into the Guggenheim are not people who are out on the periphery of the art world or, or who don't have that that curated and tuned mind. It's the people like you, honestly, who thought about this shit every day of their life for 15 years, who talked with the people who were involved in the mm-hmm. game, who confronted these issues who wrote books on the damn thing. And I'm not saying go down to the NFL's uh, Hall of Fame, which is 32 people in a room and you got, you know, individuals who are being argued for and and argued against and and one or two votes can sway things. I, I like the idea of a larger electorate. I also like the idea of it being people who actually were involved in the game and understood it and lived it. It's very interesting. Yeah, you know, and I, I get that. I get that. But I also, I think that to me, it is very much, and Kenny, you know this, it is very much a rite of passage, which is why I refer to it as Hall of Fame season where we immediately decide to like talk about who was qualified to make this yeah. decision and who wasn't. It's it. the default. It's like the beginning part of the conversation. Shouldn't it be though? Like, should, no. if, if we're, no, if, if we're, if we're going to, and, and by the way, I, uh, I, I will, my, my opinion has evolved on the museum thing. When I started voting for the hall of fame, my first response was, Holy shit. I get to vote for the hall of fame. I took a picture of my ballot. And I have a group of friends from high school who I stay in touch with. And I was like, look at this, bitches. And I was so excited <laughs> it's the, about it's, it. It's the most amazing perk you can have as a professional, I think, because it, it meant that much. And, yeah. and that's why we took it all seriously. And the reason why I'm so against this idea of taking people's votes away is because I truly believe that most people take this very seriously. They do understand that it's a huge privilege and that they do understand that it's important. And I also believe that when you look at the history of the Hall of Fame and you look at who got in and where the percentages are, we get it right a lot. We get it right. Yeah. Really. I mean, there are very few people that you can look at and say they're not in and they deserve to be in. Most people that you can look at, even if you get to somebody like Jim Rice and Dick Allen, You can make arguments as to why they didn't get in and then why one eventually got in. Right. Uh I mean, and and how much arguments 
Okay. Okay. So how much? And and Ken, because you're the only one here who actually has a ballot, <laughs> who puts it out there, and who has to go through the scrutiny. And I'm sorry, Rosie, for like taking your position. No, it's good. Here, I like but, it. Go but for but it. um, how much does the the feedback from the public make you say to yourself, "Is this something that I actually want to do?" Is this something I actually want to stand up there and defend? I know Howard hates that. Hates that. You never put your vote out there publicly, HB. Um, I used to, and then I stopped. You then know you why? Stopped. Yeah, I said, but it wasn't. But it wasn't because it wasn't because I couldn't handle the public getting mad at me. It wasn't that. It was. Be, it was because it's none of your goddamn business. It was because. It was because I don't like the whole grade grubbing thing that comes with it. And now I got to write a big ass column defending my vote. It becomes this big thing that it doesn't need to be right. It became something it was almost, you know, it's like this sort of cyber bullying need of approval sort of dichotomy here, where on the one hand, you get slammed for your vote and you shouldn't have a vote. But on the other hand, you're out there begging the public to pay attention to your ballot. And like, so who is this actually serving? I just didn't, I didn't find that piece of it to be that rewarding. Kenny, I want to- So uh, yeah, the answer is, yeah. So I, you know, maybe I'm just sick, uh, but (laughs) I I love it all. Like I, I I love, I love the emails, the tweets, I feed off it. And uh, yeah, I'm laughing because I remember a couple of years ago, I, uh, it was after Trump's first impeachment, the Russia, you know, Ukraine impeachment. And I had a line there because I, you know, one of my big thing, and how I know Howard wrote a book on Hank Aaron, uh, but I've always contested. Sorry, man, like Barry Bonds is the true home run champion. I don't care what you think. <laughs> so I think the year right after, whatever the impeachment was, I said, you know, the idea that Hank Aaron is a true home run champion is to quote an impeached president, fake news. So the amount of hate mail I got for <laughs> for a supporting a ster- you know, the steroid users, and b going after that guy. Oh, I you mean, did that on purpose, though. Oh, it's a classic yeah, line, right? Yeah. So, I mean, just like, I just, I love it. I, I, I find it so hilarious and I, I don't take it personally, uh, you know, and I just, I, I love the passion, the heat, the energy. I love the whole thing. I All think right. one of my favorite parts of this conversation has, has been Ken just revealing himself as the postiest of New York posties. Of course. This well, is yeah. the, <laughs> it's a high bar I, to clear. It's but not the same guy questions. I lived with on Mary Mark. No, Hall I was just quiet. Back then, just but I had, this, I had the same, uh, you know, the same <laughs> thoughts underneath. I'm not still pretty same. quiet. We will be right back to the Rose rotation. But first, we've hit the final week of the pro football regular season and college football is heading into the national championship. DraftKings Sportsbook has an unbelievable offer to get all fans in on the action for this exciting time on the football calendar. New customers can bet just $5 on any football team to win their game. And if they do, you win $200 in free bets. Roll Tide. So let's wind down the season with a big win. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still find your way to the winner's circle. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Football Contests. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now to, and use promo code ROSE. Just bet $5 on any football team, college or pro, and win $200 in free bets if they're victorious. That's promo code ROSE this week at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or PA only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. No, it's okay. so, Let me ask you a question, though. And Chris, I want to ask you this as well, because you yes. were going in, in, in this direction a little bit when we're talking about all of the different you brought it up with a rod, all of the different lobbying and politics that go with it. There's also an industry here, too, that started to creep up. I don't think it was as big when I first got my vote, but the teams and the and, and the campaigning, like you yeah. get these gigantic packets from the team vote for our guy. And it's not just the public and it's not, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, whatever jail cell he's heading to or wherever he's, I mean, Jonah Carey essentially got Tim Raines into the hall of fame. <laughs> right. I mean, right or wrong. I mean, this was a campaign to it, yeah. as, as much as the Dick Allen campaign, as much as, as Bly the, Levin. Bly Levin the Bly Levin campaign. Right. Yes. I mean, I remember Ken Maka when he was managing 
uh, the uh, Brewers left me a voicemail. Howard, it's Maka. Bly Levin had 60 shutouts. 60. Click. <laughs> okay. Right. And so, I mean, so as much don't as you impre- talk- don't you appreciate the brevity, though? I love that. Right. Oh, it's mm-hmm. great. I love it. That, you know, I mean, he sent me a very similar one after I had recommended he go see Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And he <laughs> left me a voicemail that said, took your recommendation, have no idea what the last two hours and 47 minutes were about. <laughs> So, I mean, if we're talking about a rod, this sort of campaigning, they all do it, right? I well, mean, they this all is do it, also... but it, that's that's why a lot of guys go into television. They want to stay relevant. They want to stay relevant. Absolutely. I mean, it, that's it. I mean, it, that's across the board in every sport. It's it's why you see so many great players in the NFL continue to be on these pregame shows. Yeah, the it's, most amazing thing that I saw, I don't remember which which player. I have to go look at my list here, but but. It might have been Bagwell and Reigns. I think it was Reigns as well. Um, the one-year leaps that these guys are making these, these last several years is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, what did Reigns go from 69 to like 84% one year? Like when he got yeah. in, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Is, is, isn't, that, isn't that just a reflection, though? I, I think that is the consequence of social media. Yeah. Agreed. You're the guy who didn't vote for Tim, you know, I, I, well, that's I've the got, cyberbullying part I was talking about. Yeah, that's that is a very, very real thing. Well, you know, we're talking about people being front and center. Raise your hand if you think David Ortiz is getting in on the first ballot. How do how you? Are the, how are the only one? Why? Um, selective justice and the power of the 617 i wonder what that first year is going to be you know i mean boston media is no joke right and extremely extremely um uh, supportive i tend to think now that we're getting really close to it that maybe not but why is he on the air right now right i mean there's another i mean you know david ortiz as fantastic an interview and as great as he's always been to to most of us who have who have spoken with him when he was playing there is a strategy as well there for being on tv the last several years this is his hall of fame climb right you got to be in the public eye i you see i i don't know that i agree with that i think david ortiz was bound to be on tv regardless just because he's a so, showman so do, he loves so being I, the, but it helps loves being the center of attention you know it 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 does not hurt. I, I don't disagree with that. But but he was he was always seen, even through the steroid accusations, as somebody who is larger than life and charming. A- yeah. Alex Rodriguez needed to go through an entire reputation rescue to get him to where he is right now. D- David Ortiz, it, it's almost like he you know he tested positive. He w- he was the first athlete that I remember at least who tested positive, and there was almost a collective shrug. It was like, yeah, well, that's the you selective know. justice part of it. But there's two things here at work that I think we should talk about. Number one, Alex Rodriguez has always needed approval from the day he came into the big leagues. So it's Accurate. not like suddenly I'm in the I'm, I'm in the Hall of Fame conversation. I remember the first time I met him, 98, we're at the Kingdom. And I was in my first year. So I'd been on the beat. We're in Seattle. I had to be on the beat five weeks, maybe four weeks, whatever it was. And so he did his thing. I leave the visitor's clubhouse. I'm walking through the tunnel in the kingdom. And I hear these spikes clacking behind me. And I turn around and it's him. And he looks at me and he says, did that go all right? I'm like, you don't even know who I am. Why does it matter what I think? Did what go all right? It was a five minute talk with the visiting writers before the start of a series. I mean, so... The, the, the entire idea of need, sure, Ortiz and, and A-Rod aren't even in the same category. Um, but there's one other thing that I think we should discuss that I've always been wrestling with, and that is, how do we even know he tested positive? Mm-hmm. Right? That survey testing. Alex? We had the, oh, Alex Ortiz. Sorry. Ortiz, that 2003 yeah. survey testing, 
has been the has been taken as fact and there's a, it's got the least amount of information behind it um in terms of like for me the the only thing that i remember about survey testing really was that there was a pattern right the pattern was anybody who came out really vociferously about survey testing and about steroids their name got outed right right but we don't even have all the names of the people who tested positive on the survey. All the, the only people we got on the survey testing were people who seemed to be either a little obvious, like suddenly what happened to your career, or protesting too much. Well, I think Ortiz has acknowledged that he tested positive. I mean, Did he? Uh, yeah, yeah I, yeah. I remember they were at Yankee Stadium. It was about a week after the story broke and he had a press conference while Michael Weiner, may he rest in peace, was there. I think yep. the commissioner's office even sent a representative as a show of yes, solidarity. Yes, they did. They did. I remember uh, that. And then when he retired at the end uh, at Fenway, Rob Manfred came to his retirement and spoke about the survey test, explaining why it shouldn't be held to any standard. You know, essentially, there was an appeal process you know, because the, the, sur- the testing was a survey. There was no yeah. discipline attached to it. The only discipline, per se, was if enough of you idiots fail this, there will be discipline next. There will year. be discipline, sure. Yeah, and of course, enough of the idiots failed. Yeah. But yeah, well, the I'm idea not, that I'm not that defending Ortiz test, at all. I'm, I'm not defending yeah. Ortiz at all. I'm, I'm, I've always questioned the selectivity of whose name got leaked on the survey testing mm-hmm. in general. Well, yeah, I mean, we can really go down that rabbit hole if you want. I think there's only been three names reported, and I have it, my thoughts. It's just Alex, Ortiz, and Sammy. I think and that's Sosa. It. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, and I have my thoughts on that. I, that's pretty deep down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to introduce something else into this that I think uh, plays a much, much larger role than it did even five years ago, and I think infected postseason uh, awards voting this year as well, which is the wins above replacement factor. Um, Alex Rodriguez ended up with, I think, 120 war. Barry Bonds, I think, has 170. Uh, David Ortiz, in terms of, of baseball reference war, is lower than Tim Hudson. He's lower than Mark Burley, um, lower than Sheffield, Todd Helton, Andrew Jones. I mean, there are a bunch of dudes who are higher than that. And if we talk about the lift that guys who tested positive or are linked to steroids get from younger voters who are coming in and don't cast as many aspersions on it, maybe as older ones do. I think there's also a pushback because of the war factor where people just don't look at the ball games and the accomplishments and, and what they did uh, and who David Ortiz was yeah, that's through huge. the same lens that the ball riders who were actually at the games at the time. All did. right. So Jeff, are you saying that just on, Merit alone that David Ortiz is not a Hall of Famer performance wise. I'm saying that people who bowed at the altar of war might try to make that argument. I think it's complete bullshit. And uh, he's on my ballot if I'm voting still uh, not not even a second thought about it. Well, just to lend some perspective on the war issue, he would have the lowest war. For a non reliever to get into Cooperstown since Jim Rice more than 10 years ago. So that just gives you a little bit of perspective on where it's he at East Coast sits. bias. It's at Boston bias. <laughs> I, I think if you throw in Ortiz's postseason accomplishments, though, that I think that really. But why wouldn't you? You have right. to. Don't exactly. You? I, I, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm, saying, might, yeah. That's what I'm yeah. saying, my longtime friend. <laughs> Howard, you well, would I mean, you're th- like, well, if you throw in the. Of course you do. I mean, uh, that's what I'm he, saying. He, right. I mean, shit. I mean, I, I, I look at a guy like Ortiz as a. You know, you could make an argument that he and Ted Williams are the two most important Red Sox in history. Like ever. <laughs> that team has been around since 1901. Right. I mean, and, and we were all there. I don't know if you, you were probably in the eighth or ninth grade in 04, Jeff, but. Um, um, First year covering ball, HB. Yeah, baby. Right. I mean, we know. I mean, there's no, there's no any of this without what took place in 03 and 04, you know, in Boston. And so it's just such a, I I don't know. I mean, as much as we talk about everything else with steroids and the rest of it, that's really not as big a deal. I think what's really bothered me about the voting over the last several years is the desire to turn this into science, but that's what's happening with the entire sport. 
you know, the whole game is being, I think they, you know, if you're going to, if, if you're going to say, well, you know, he's going to have the lowest war since Jim Rice, my response, that is good. Because if you saw <laughs> David Ortiz play, you know, a hall of famer when you see one, nice. right. You know, impact of the, you know, to the game impact on the game when you see it. So, you know, I mean, I, I sort of felt like, um, when I would do my ballot, like my first couple of ballots, the new ones, it's not that big a deal. Plus, I wasn't I'm not voting anymore, but I had to go ask the other players because there were certain guys that I just didn't have a bulk of their careers. So yep. I would I would call Joe Morgan, your friend, Joe Morgan. May he rest in peace, Jeff, and um, would ask him about his teammate. Davey Concepcion was on one of the ballots. I think he was on my first ballot. I was a kid in the set. You know, I don't remember. I could not say whether or not Dave Concepcion was a Hall of Famer, right? So you spend a lot of time doing a lot of research about who, you know, how they affected the game and how their peers saw them. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot of score settling that goes with that, as we see with the Veterans Committee. But at the same time, there's a whole lot of things outside of the the analytic numbers that can determine for you who is worthy of that space. I'm Real sure quick, all those people uh, who you were advocating for keeping their votes earlier were calling up Joe Morgan and doing the same thing as you, Howard, right? You want a piece of me? <laughs> I do. I, I, no, you, actually, I think you want the whole thing. I do. I think I want the smoke. <laughs> oh, you want some smoke? How about bringing up the name of Kurt Schilling, who's on the ballot for the last time? He got the highest percentage of vote uh, last year. Remember, can you start? Can you start with Ken since he's actually got a vote I'm going here? To. Because I'm genuinely curious where this one's going. Do you think Kenny? Uh, a did he? Let's start with does he get in? I don't think he does. Ooh, interesting. And then he wasn't B, he? At, he was 69 last year, right? Yeah, or 70? yeah. Seven. Well, last year I believe he was at 71. percent I think he fell 16 votes shy. Yeah. 16 votes, not 16 mm -hmm. percentage points. 16 votes. Kenny, do you think that if social media had not been invented that Kurt Schilling would be in Cooperstown already. Yes, I do. So why, why do baseball writers hold his opinions against him? Well, I certainly, you know, I don't Chris. And I mean, going back to my earlier thoughts, like last year I voted for him and then trashed him when he reacted the way he did. Uh, <laughs> so I got, I got hate mail from all sides, which again, I love, uh, now, here's I, it's a point I, I'm glad you brought up, because I want to make this point. I, I know the one person who wrote it was Joe Posnanski, um, who I like and respect Joe. But I know last year he wrote, I'm not voting for Kurt Schilling because I don't want to give him that that state. I don't want to give him his, his day on the stage. Right. And I disagree with that so strongly because I think there's too much focus on that day on the stage on how the already inducted Hall of Famers feel about sitting on that stage and not enough emphasis on the museum on the fact that in 50 years, people will be visiting that hall of plaques and you're gonna have to explain to them, why isn't Kurt Schilling here? Why isn't Barry Bonds here? Why isn't Roger Clemens here, A-Rod, et cetera? Uh, and I, like, yeah, we'll, we'll hold our nose and get through the damn day. I, I think there's actually a chance Schilling wouldn't show up, which would be win-win, uh, you know? Uh, but you know, like, yeah, let Barry Bonds have his day, you know, hold your nose if that's the way you feel about it, but then he will have his rightful place in that hall of plaques for eternity. Yeah. Is 216 wins enough for him to be a hall of fame pitcher? I always viewed Schilling as a, I viewed Schilling, not necessarily borderline, but I, I viewed him based on his career and on his time period. He's in a very interesting time period where the position of starting pitcher has shifted so much. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, it hurt him because he was at the tail end when you weren't getting as many W's anymore. It didn't really matter as much, but on the other hand, it helped him because he was one of the last horses. He was one of the last guys that you were like, give me the ball. We ain't losing today. And the fact that he did it in the postseason, he's a hall of famer. I mean, by, by, the, by the way, and, and, and I appreciate that we're talking about Kurt Schilling and his accomplishments as a pitcher, because when I was voting, maybe this was naive of me. Maybe it was wrong of me. I can, I can understand arguments on the other side. I voted based on what a guy did on the field. I think the character clause is complete garbage and needs to be extricated from the entire process because I think the notion that sports writers are going to be the moral arbiters for baseball players is 
positively laughable. That that is that is not our place, first of all. But let's suppose that it were. We don't know these guys. Like that that's the that's the truth. We don't know them. What we know is how they choose to treat us in a one hour window before the game and a 30 minute window after the game. And there are some, especially those of us who are around for a while, who actually do get to know the human beings and hear stories about them. But in reality, there's so much about players that that I don't know. I, I'm never comfortable sitting there and, and using that as the criteria to keep them out for what they did on the field. I find personally Kurt Schilling's opinions on almost everything in life to be completely abhorrent. I think the way that he treats uh, uh, communities of color, LGBTQ, the Nazi paraphernalia, all the things that you know about Kurt Schilling now, the memes that he puts out there, uh, just the the cruelness and and callousness uh, is as abhorrent as it gets. Uh, I still would vote for him because he was a really good baseball player. And because this isn't a museum about who's a scumbag and who isn't, this is a museum celebrating best players in baseball history. And he was one of them. Yeah. I Howard disagree Link. with a lot of what you're saying there um, on the, in terms of the character clause. I never looked at the character clause as primary. It's a piece of the criteria that you're considering. Okay. I, I would defy anybody who would suggest that the character clause was a reason or not reason to vote for someone that makes you a bad voter. Right. I mean, this is just pe- that's a piece of it. That's a part of it. And the reason why I don't think the character clause needs to go is because this sport spends a lot of time profiting off of character. They spend a lot of time selling character. They go out of their way to sell people's characters and the players go out of their way to sell character. So if you're going to try to profit off of character, you better walk the walk. Right. OK, better- so, so so did you when when you were voting, did you yep. do the opposite Kurt Schilling? Did you give Dale Murphy, who by most accounts is a pretty tremendous human being uh, in well, the things I he always, does? Did yeah, you give man. him additional like consideration? Yeah, I think because, you should because. OK, then then that's because, because it. I think Listen, that's at the- least I, I don't ever I don't ever think you're going to be inconsistent because you because you're too smart for that because you think about this too much. So I, I like if you're going to go both ways with it, I get that. I, I just I look at the. Uh, I think he's a good guy, but do I know he's a good guy? No, I don't know if he's actually a good well, guy. I mean, like, let's face it. Are you going to say after everything he did and all the things? Well, because once again, the quiet guy may have a body, uh, uh, may have a freezer of bodies in his basement. Who knows? <laughs> right. You don't know. And to your point, I don't know. I mean, I've been covering this, what, 20 something years now. And how many professional athletes have I actually been in their house on a social call? Right. I mean, that's not what this is. So but to me, I think that character clause does matter as a piece of it, because as we all know, there are people who make the job difficult and there are people who make the job easy and make the job easier. And there is a piece of that that does matter when you're selling your product to the public. Right. That piece of it is important. And, you know, if you're going to throw a baseball in the crowd and hit somebody that you're going to remember that. Right. You know, this (laughs) stuff. Is that a reason that Albert Bell is not in the Hall of Fame? No, but he didn't help himself by not being the nicest fella. So these things sort of do matter a little bit. Um, But I never looked at the character clause as the way in or out. And as for Schilling, what's really what I always find really funny about Kurt Schilling is that I didn't know any of this about Schilling until after he was gone. I always had a fine relationship with Schilling as a player. I didn't I didn't know that he had gone off the deep end until he had already retired. I mean, I remember going to Schilling's locker many, many times. And I remember Pedro Gomez and he, they never got along because he covered him, you know, mm-hmm. early in the day. They couldn't stand each other. But my individual relationship with Schilling, it was fine. But when you were voting, Howard, I just want to clarify this. Did you not vote for him because he's a dickbag? No, I didn't vote. The reason why I didn't vote for Schilling was because I wasn't exactly sure. Okay. Because I thought he was in that Mike Mussina, David Wells category. Got it where I thought it was like, they're not getting in and and at the time. And I was like, and he was in the Louis Tiant category, like a guy who was a horse, who was legit, who's also got great playoff numbers. And he's not getting in. 
And so I viewed him, I was like, okay, if you're going to go shilling, you're going to go shilling because you're really heavily weighing that postseason. David Wells has a great postseason record, uh-huh. right? Louis Tian has a great postseason history, right? Didn't play as many playoff rounds, but anybody who remembers the heart and soul of those Red Sox teams, Louis Tian was legit, not even close to the Hall of Fame. You know, Jack Morris waited for, for forever to get in. And everyone looks at Jack Morris as the quintessential playoff horse. So that was the reason why I wasn't really in on chilling because those guys had a much more difficult time getting in. I put him in that category. And I think CeCe Sabathia is going to have a similar sort of struggle getting in, even though he was nowhere near. You you think CeCe's clear Hall of Famer? First ballot. First ballot. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Really? For his era? era? Yeah. That's interesting because I've – I think he's getting in, but I, I, I've always wondered about the ease of which he's getting in. Oh, no, I, I, I say first foul. And I, I think the character clause will benefit him. Yeah. Well, people won't recognize him when he's on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you that. Damn, CC, well, shout out, I was going to say, hey, Chris, one, one other thing, too, as we're going around this. I am stunned and remain stunned that... Sammy Sosa is like an afterthought, you know? And like, so part of me in thinking about this time period is like the bill coming due. Has the bill come due on anybody more than Sammy Sosa? Kenny, did you, you yeah. voted for him, didn't you? You know, Sammy and uh, Howard might, you know, come over to my place and strangle me, but like I am a more statistically inclined guy, voter and you look at Sammy, like the on-base percentage is not great. Yeah, for the era, the defense we all know was he didn't play any defense. Yeah, Uh, you know he had what four or five consecutive monster historic years, and even if you put aside how he achieved those numbers, the totality of the career. Yeah, again, basically when I've had room for him on my ten, I have voted for him. But there have been years. uh, This will be his ten among his first nine where I thought he did not make my top ten, and as you know, the ballot allows you only to put 10 names. Yeah, yeah. and not, not surprising at all, except for one revelation along what you're saying, which is this generation of voter does not buy that deeply into the benchmarks. There used to no. be automatic benchmarks. Sure. There are no sure. automatic benchmarks. I was talking to Ray Ratto about mm-hmm. this when he was telling me Mark McGuire is not a Hall of Famer. He's mm-hmm. just not, he was not good enough. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's got 583 home runs. Like, not good enough. And so at 609, not good enough, which is a fascinating thing to say, uh, you know, compared to the other eras of baseball. Sure. Sure. But I I think I I think I think you look at I think you look at Sammy Sosa and and you look at the career OPS and uh, he's he's closer to Mark Teixeira and Bobby Abreu than he is like Todd Helton. Hmm. And that to me is probably the biggest check mark in the box of Sammy Sosa is Hall of Very Good. The, the problem is if you're if you're a peak guy, his peak was incredible. Like you you look and I, you know, again, I'm not the warist of war guys, but I very much respect the way that Jay Jaffe approaches the Hall of Fame in looking at the peak years because to me. When I was voting, I felt like there are two paths to the Hall of Fame. Number one, either you were the ass kickingest of ass kickers for a very short period of time, the best of the best, you know, top like multiple MVP awards, or Cy Young awards in a short period of time. It's why to me, um, you know, Jacob deGrom is going to be a very interesting case when it comes around. It's why if Corey Kluber has you know, one more great year and he has two Cy Youngs there. He's at least going to merit consideration as a pitcher from this generation who, who frankly, they don't put up the bulk. They don't put up the innings. And it's why I tend to agree with Ken. I think there's going to be a big innings renaissance soon because nobody pitches them anymore that we're going to look at Sabathia as an anachronism um, and, and somebody who was incredible for what he did and what he and what his time stood for. But, but the other guy who I've grown to appreciate over time is uh, the compiler. If you can stick around for 20-plus years in Major League Baseball, you're a bad motherfucker. 
You're a, like, you're a, you you're really, setting your way to the Hall of Fame. You're you re- you're the you're the Nissan with three hundred thousand miles on it. And and you know what? It, it, like, I had a Honda <laughs> with two hundred thousand miles on it, a two door black Honda Civic. The tailpipe rotted off on the middle of the interstate going to New York City one time, and we put it back together. And she kept chugging for another fifty thousand. Uh-huh. I love that car. Right. And I, and if you tell me that car is not a Hall of Famer, <laughs> I can say I understand. I can also say you're wrong because she does belong in the Hall of Fame because sticking around and playing baseball. You know, I I I don't think people appreciate until especially you get into your thirties, until you get into your forties, until your yeah. body starts reacting differently. And by the way, we just sit there and type on keyboards. Like right. we don't How do a whole lot is. physically mm-hmm. and, and our bodies every day when we wake up feel like death. The guys who are going out there and still in their late thirties and forties uh, are, are posting every day. I have so much more respect for them than mm-hmm. I did when they were younger. And if you can be really good for a long period of time, I think that, is Hall of Fame worthy? Yeah, agreed. Right. And I, I was going to say, there's a Craig Biggio. Yeah, Jeff Passan will call you later. Yeah, <laughs> he will. No problem. Yeah. All right, thanks. I was always a dominance over longevity guy, unless you had some serious longevity. Yes. Right? Un- unless yes. you were that dude, right? Yeah. And I used to go back and forth over. I remember talking to Wash one day about my Hall of Fame ballot. We were going back and forth, and his what? You know, Wash was always was he the baddest motherfucker on the field? <laughs> Then he was the baddest motherfucker on the field. That's it. <laughs> right. And so, um, and that's kind of it. Right. And then, in fact, yeah. Reggie and I had this same conversation about Jim Rice. And he's like, everyone's talking about, he's like, Jim Rice was the baddest dude out there for X number of years. And you yeah. have to respect that. And the guy that I actually went against was Reigns. Because if you look at Reigns' first eight years, I penalized Reigns for playing 21 years, 22 years. Right. Because Tim Reigns' first eight were as good as anybody's first eight. But Tim Reigns was a part-time player from nine to 22. I mean, he really stopped being an everyday player in like 1991. Wow. And um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree with you, Jeff, on the, on the pathway. You know, and I do think there are two pathways. And I think that sometimes you can be Depending on the career, you can be penalized at the beginning or you can be penalized at the end. Oh, I mean, right? a- Andrew, Andrew Jones to me is fascinating because it, like if you look at Andrew Jones through age 30, it, he is an absolute no doubter, like like as no doubt as no doubt gets right. Uh, played center field at a truly elite what's eight time gold glove winner. I mean, it's, it's something along those lines. Like he was as good as it gets hit bombs, um, stole bases early in his career. Like everything about Andrew Jones was great through age 30. And then he just fell off a cliff and and you want to talk about part-time player. I mean, that that's what happened at, at 31 and he was done at 35. So how do you, how do you reconcile the excellence that was Andrew Jones through age 30 with the nothingness that was there <laughs> afterwards. Was he good? Was he good enough in those first 10 years to make up for the rest of it? Yeah, um, that's, I, I'm going to, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm an Andrew guy and I was a brains guy. Cause I felt like, yeah, they built their platform in the early parts. And then, you know, that both of them helped contribute to contending teams, you know, and, and, and again, if you want to use character positively, I mean, I, I was around both of those guys during their Yankees years. I'm like, yep. you know, those are the two of the few guys that Jeter actually liked, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> once again, Cooperstown worthy for no other reason than that. Um, I got two quick things and then we're going to let you guys go. Kenny, since you're the only one that's still voting um, because you choose to, and because you enjoy the abuse because it helps your brand or something like that. Yeah, he says, the smoke. Give me one guy. Yeah that you would pound the table for that people aren't paying close enough attention to? That's a good question, Chris. Uh, and I'm on, I haven't, I actually haven't opened the, opened up the letter yet. Uh, but, 
shit. Why don't you go to the other two? And can I come back on that? You, you can. Is there is there a guy? Is there a Jeff Kent out there? Is there a Todd Helton? Is it somebody else? Is well, is Tim Lincecum? Because somebody mentioned, uh, Jet, I think you mentioned Corey Kluber. Tim Lincecum won a couple of Cy Youngs and was a critical part of jump starting that Giants dynasty in the early part of I the I mean, decade. how about Scott Rowland? Can I pound the table for Scott Rowland? Absolutely. I yeah, mean, Scott yeah. Rowland's one of those coin flip guys for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, again, I, I do, I enjoy looking at those metrics. And, 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 you know, again, I using the eye test too. Scott Rowland was a terrific defender at third base. And, and when you combine his glove work there, uh, whether it's the eye test or the metrics, with the offensive numbers he put up, and uh, and he played for a long time, I have voted for him every year. I do anticipate him voting for again, uh, voting for him again this year. I, I I have such a difficult time reconciling Scott Rowland because I loved watching him play. Like I, I uh, watching Scott Rowland field a ground ball and throw from third to first was like, this makes me such a dork. It was one of my sneaky favorite things about baseball for like a five year span, because I was in Kansas city starting in 2004. It was my first year uh, covering ball. The Royals sucked. I think they went 58 and 104 that year. So I tried to spend as much time in St. Louis as possible. And Scott Rowland was uh, as, as solid a ball player as, it, uh, as there was. Um, did he pass? The Howard Bryant, Ron Washington, baddest motherfucker on the field test. No, he's top five. I think the highest he finished in MVP voting was fourth. And so it, it, it with him is the war is there. The defense is there. But was the longevity there enough to make up for the lack of like peak peak with him? And and that's like you can make a case there. I always was more of a small hall guy. And, and I think I probably would have gone no if I'm still voting on Roland and felt terrible about it because uh, he was he was the one guy in that clubhouse who would look at Tony LaRusa and say, This guy is so full of shit. <laughs> and it was great every time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if there's anybody that I would bang the table on. I think it's been really interesting. I've always been a small hall guy. Um, simply because I think that's what it's for, but I do think that the dynamics are changing. I think that the, yeah. the culture is changing. The dynamics are changing. The idea of what a hall of famer is changing to Jeff's point, because how many times did we make fun of Don Sutton? He was never the best player in his own team, but you're respecting the journey of what it takes to do this. It's hard to do this. And, you know, and, and, and I think that maybe we're saying the same thing, that the benchmarks used to add up for that. They used to make up for that person. If you were not a great player, but you got to 300 wins, you were getting in, right? I mean, so that was sort of that. What did Sutton finish with, 324, right? I mean, so that's doing work, right? I mean, you, you may not have ever been Bob Gibson, but you had 324, I'm sorry, so, anyone, uh, you know, we make fun of wins. Anyone who wins 300 games should be in, period, end of story. Like, if, if your arm lasted that long, you are in. Jeff, do you have a visitor in the ESPN cafeteria, by the way? I know. I, Sarah, you're in the shot. No, it's great. What, what's she eating? Sarah, what it's are like you eating? like pineapples or something. Holy shit, Howard, wow. do you have the greatest <laughs> eyes in the world? No. You nailed it? Pick that. I, Jesus! What the hell? What? We're going Mike to Mike Vegas. Mike drop, you, ladies and gentlemen. What are you doing? That's my work is done here. That was some Ted Williams shit. <laughs> oh my god! Your work is not done because we get to spin the wheel of moderately interesting things all on right. the Rose rotation. Ah. Okay, you guys all get the answer, and then we'll get you out of here. Let's see here. Watch out! What are you guys streaming right now? That's interesting, Howard. You mean like television? Yeah, like, well, streaming. Well, I mean, it does appear on a television. It does appear on a television, or or perhaps a... All right, I'm watching a few things. I'm obviously watching Hawkeye, and tonight it's Wednesday, so we've got episode four tonight. Looking forward to that. Um, I did my best with the Beatles, um, but 
I, I had to admit, I was just taken by watching Yoko Ono stare at John Lennon while balancing her checkbook and knitting. I'm like, this is what have interesting. Raul Peck's Exterminate All the Brutes on HBO is mind blowing. Very good. Jeff? Uh, Hawkeye as well. Company Man, let's go Disney Plus. Um, see the difference? Did you see the yeah. difference? Yeah. Suck up? Yeah. Yeah, I just I just got a new contract. I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you don't have to. You just got a new contract. Uh, fair point. I know where my bread is buttered. Um, succession, loving it. Uh, kind of bummed it's ending. I, I love Succession um, in spite of everyone on the show being an irredeemable asshole. Like that, it, it takes such good writing to do that, to make you watch characters who are such terrible people, but they're, they're still enthralling in their own ways. Uh, and uh, dope that sick. different from covering a baseball team? Yeah. It's <laughs> uh, D- dope sick, which is about uh, the Sackler family and uh, essentially how uh, OxyContin became the scourge that it is around the country right now. And uh, it's a really sad and really important story about uh, the the confluence of, um, you know, of of big business and how the people inside of government will look past misdeeds and unleash uh, plagues uh, every bit as bad as as natural ones. Only this is man made uh, on an unwitting country. Very uplifting. Thank you, Kenny. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm behind uh, my Disney uh, friends. I'm only on Loki, and I'm enjoying that. It's good. Uh, it's good. And, and I am. Uh, my wife and I just finished episode three of this season of Succession, which, let me stress, given where I work, is based on no one. It's completely, <laughs> uh, you know, come up from, you know, just it's the creative genius of Jesse Armstrong, not based on anybody. Uh, and then I'm also watching The Shrink Next Door, uh, with Wolf Farrell and Paul Rudd, yes. great, based on a great, great podcast. I am biased because my cousin is one of the co-executive producers. Oh. I wrote episode two. Uh, so I am biased, but I am very much enjoying it. Very good. Awesome. We just finished Made, my wife. And I, I haven't watched that. It was good. It was. Yeah. It's tough to watch, but it was good. My mom watched that. Yeah, that's kind of where we are in life. To be honest, can I can I also <laughs> throw in can I also throw in Curb Your Enthusiasm? Of which course, the, having the, the start the, of it. The, the, the watermelon the watermelon episode this year i thought was an absolute all-timer it was like, unbelievable really yes. really good season uh gentlemen i want to thank you so much for giving uh giving our viewers and our listeners a little uh little taste of what the uh the bbwaa is going through and uh this was fascinating and eye-opening and uh i think kenny we're gonna have a shout out this year on january 25th again you guys gonna pitch another uh, shout out that's what i'm wagering oh. yeah Oh, really? I yeah, I wouldn't back wager back. a lot. I think I think Kurt has a chance. Uh, I don't. You don't. I, you don't see a fifteen percent jump on Barry. I don't. I just don't. No. Isn't well, it amazing that we did an entire pod talking about this and never brought up Roger Clemens' name? I did once, but just did in you? passing. Yeah, Roger. In passing. Yeah, it just in passing. It just feels like it's they'll be stuck in sixty-two percent bill, and I'll yeah. see you somewhere down the line. I don't know. Can I um, do, can I just say for the record, he deserves to be in, and Bonds deserves to be in, yeah. and A Rod deserves to be in, and Schilling deserves to be in, and Manny Ramirez deserves to be in, and I would probably cut my ballot off right there. And it is weird voting for five people who did things that I I find morally objectionable that I think actually actively in in ways uh, in ways active and passive hurt the game but they were the best and isn't that isn't that what we're here to do put the best players into the museum that celebrates and talks about the best players it's an interesting way to uh close things out uh howard we look forward to your uh continued work there at metal arc media at espn and also with your book ricky which i believe is coming out in may right in oh June. i can't wait June. i can't wait okay. it's gonna be so, so good yeah. not, does he know your name ricky <laughs> yeah <laughs> That dude. Awesome. Thank God. <laughs> I was going to be so disappointed if you were that like, That dude writing a book about me. me. No. 
Jeff, uh, so hopefully we'll see you on ESPN at some point once this bullshit's over. <laughs> Ken, enjoy the abuse come January 20th. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Guys, thank you very much, and thanks very much to you, thank you. and to our outstanding producer, the one and only Robbie Shirocco. We will see you next time here on the Chris Rose Rotation. Yes, Jeff, it is indeed a production of John Boy Media. Uh. <laughs>